this is Ashley McHugh from Insurance Newsnet, and I will be the administrator for today's webinar, Securing Futures, the Power of Life Insurance Across Generations. Moderating the webinar is John Fercucci, Editor-in-Chief at Insurance Newsnet. Our panel today includes Flory Willis, the National Sales Manager for Lincoln Money Guard, responsible for the bank, wire, and independent wholesaling teams. A 20-plus year industry veteran, Flory was also a top Money Guard wholesaler for nine years, earning a spot on Lincoln's Wall of Fame. Also joining us today is Karen Terry, Assistant Vice President of Insurance, Insurance Research at Limra and Loma. She oversees Limra's individual product research team, which provides research on product design, company practices, market trends, and the sales and marketing of individual life, disability, and critical illness products. Karen serves as a resource on industry performance measures to Limra staff, member companies, and the media. Please ask any questions you may have in the questions pane during our discussion, and we, we will get to as many as we can at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks, Ashley, and thanks everyone for joining us. We're very excited to have our two panelists today representing different segments of the industry. Long-term care is a growing concern for many Americans who are turning to life insurance hybrid products to address that need. Our panels today have expertise in both the data analysis and the real world sales of hybrid products. We're gonna cover all aspects of the growing market for LTC life products. In addition, we're gonna leave a little time to cover the market for life insurance for younger generations. But before we begin, Ashley has a poll for our audience. Uh, Ashley? Yeah, so the first poll we have is just, what is your role? Are you a financial advisor, an insurance agent, in distribution with a financial or insurance company, support or back office, or you're just interested in what we have today? We'll give you just a moment to cast your vote in there. All right, John, it looks like over half of our audience are insurance agents, um, followed by financial advisors. All right, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Great, thanks, Ashley. And as noted previously, life insurance and long-term care have come together to offer creative solutions that Americans are buying into. Flory, can you start us off with an overview of these products and how they perform? Absolutely, thanks, John, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, you know, the, the hybrid long-term care space has really evolved over the past, I would say, two decades. Um, and I think a lot of it is to fill a void, right? The hybrid products aren't new, right? We've had Money Guard and, and other life with riders for 35 years plus now, right? However, the popularity has really grown as we've seen the traditional long-term care market shrink and come out of favor, although it's still an important part of the segment and fits the needs for, for many clients. You now see a lot more either straight up life insurance solutions with either chronic care or long-term care riders. You have annuities as well that have, you know, act, feel like a, like a money guard type hybrid or have long-term care provisions in them in terms of income withdrawals. And then you have the space of thought of like, what well, we call like a, a I'm trying to say the hybrids like a money guard that there are other types of solutions in. So, you know, it's a lot evolved a lot and even the structure of the solutions to make it more accessible um, as we've seen the traditional long-term care space shrink in terms of providers, that's where you've seen the hybrid solutions expand uh, and, and fill that void for this important need for clients. All right, thanks, Flory. And Karen, just to put some numbers to this trend, could you give us an update on these hybrid products have soared up limer sales charts in recent years? Sure, let me just share my screen. So as Flory mentioned, um, these products have been popular for a very long time or in existence for a very long time. Limra has been collecting sales on combination products since about 2009 um, as they became more popular. And yes, we've seen some tremendous growth in interest and in sales of life long-term care combination products. You can see um, total premium um, and total policies both showed um, double digit increases over the past decade. Um, with a few exceptions, you'll see in 2014, um, total premium showed a decline. And that was really 
not a shift in interest in the products. That was a shift in the type of products that companies were offering. So initially, we saw a lot of single premium sales um, with products like MoneyGuard. And back around 2014, we started seeing an expansion of the market to make it more accessible to customers and a shift towards more recurring premium. Um, so that's that decline. But definitely interest um, has increased tremendously. Um, we saw a decrease during the pandemic like we did for many products. Um, more significant for life long-term care products because they're a little more complicated than some of the other life products that are offered like term and whole life. Uh, but still, then again, we saw a tremendous rebound. And we'll talk a little bit about 2021 and what was going on there um, in addition to just the pandemic rebound in a little bit, um, because that was definitely influenced um, by some of the regulatory action in Washington state. Um, declines in 2022. Um, but that's, again, in comparison to just that exponential growth in 2021. So we don't expect those declines to continue. We expect these products to continue to be popular. Now, there are several different types of products in this market. Um, we have what we call the long-term care extension or, or the hybrid products like the Money Guard um, products. We also have life products with long-term care acceleration riders and life products with chronic illness riders. And you can see that those acceleration riders really represent a, a significant portion of the market, um, especially those CI riders. We've had more companies introducing them and an increase in popularity for them as well. Um, so they represent um, over 60% of premium, 70% um, of policies. The premiums, of course, are going to be higher for those extension products, so they're going to, to capture a higher share of that premium. Um, and then we've also seen um, these products overtake market share in terms of any type of long-term care solutions. So um, they represent the majority of the, the long-term care coverage in terms of lives covered um, when you compare it with the standalone long-term care products. Lori, uh, maybe you can tell your life LT options and types of products include they target and what are the advantages for those consumers? So we're really trying to expand the ages of clients, right? And and I think one of the challenges with long-term care is clients don't pay attention to this until you know with some use the analogy like buying homeowner's insurance when the house is on fire, right? Everybody's had that experience when a client comes in and they call, or they call you up and say, I really want to talk about long-term care. And they show up and all of a sudden they're using a walker. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> no wonder you want to talk about it. You now understand the need, even though you've been sharing it with them for, for many, many years. So we are trying to really start younger. And so that's where, from an innovation standpoint, right? Back in the day, the original LTC extension version of Money Guard was a lump sum, right? And that at that point, it was like little old ladies at the bank turning CDs. Now that client is still buying this. However, with the flex pay, right, it's now more accessible to more people, people who are funding it with cash flow. Same with life with the rider. I think that's what's very attractive with the life with either the acceleration or the chronic illness with acceleration is that it's more accessible being able to pay over time. And that's where that void from the exit of traditional long-term care has been filled. And then we continue to grow the appeal where we came out with a variable version of the LTC extension products, which was called MoneyGuard Market Advantage three years ago. And that brought the average age down to the early 50s from early 60s for us in that solution. So again, it's a younger client finding that the fixed or the, the, you know, the more fixed life products not being as attractive, but the variable component. So again, the demographic is, we can start talking about this younger, insurability is better, and we now have solutions that can help meet that. So um, to answer your question, we're trying to hit all demographics before it's too late, right? That's where some of the annuity solutions um, have for clients in their 70s where it could double or triple the money with lower thresholds from an underwriting standpoint, fill a void. Uh, so I think it's important to understand what solutions fit where, but we as an industry are trying to increase access um, across demographics, uh, but definitely trying to go younger from insurability 
and affordability and create solutions that are attractive to them. And that's where the investment driven solution came in. So why are the younger clients buying into the hybrid products? Um, from that pr perspective, right, I think the younger, especially the, the, the life with Rider or Money Guard Market Advantage, which is our variable driven one, I think they like the idea that if there's not care needed, there's growth to the death benefit on the Money Guard Market Advantage side. On the life side, they like knowing, you know, the pool is there and they have the death benefit if care is not needed. Also potential growth in, in, in the underlying um, liquidity or account values is attractive. And then they're also starting to see their parents, right? We talk about the boomers a lot in long-term care. Lots of times by the time like our boomers are now in their you know, 65 year olds, now some of them are in their seventies, they're either dealing with themselves needing care or they've seen their parents deal with parents needing care or caring for parents themselves. I know that's a lot of dynamics, but all of a sudden they realize, gosh, this is emotionally and financially very involved. And the younger generation doesn't have a pension typically to fall back on that the older Good generation point. did, right? So they understand that they are gonna be on the hook for funding this type of need. And so it's an, another item on top of IRAs, 401ks, different things to, that they need to start funding from an overall financial planning perspective. Just out of curiosity, in terms of the Money Guard hybrid product, is there a sweet spot in terms of age are you seeing a particular age that gravitates toward it? So the, the variable solution, which is Money Guard Market Advantage, that average age, we're, we're now actually starting to work with some clients in their 30s and 40s. The average age is 51. So that's definitely come down younger. On the fixed solution, we're seeing that continue to be an average age of around 63. Um, the average ages are also skewed, right? Because insurability, right? And you, I, there are plenty of statistics out there. So these aren't unique to Lincoln. But once a client gets into their 70s, I think the approval rating is less than 50%, right? So they may want it at that age, but can you get it? And that's why we talk a lot about health as an asset class. And unfortunately, health is a declining asset. <laughs> <laughs> so the sooner so we can talk about capitalizing our health as an asset, the better. So we're trying to go younger so we can capitalize on our health as, a, as an asset. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I like that. Uh, Karen, I know that Limer did some research in which you asked consumers their enthusiasm level for combo products and the reason for buying. Could you talk about that? Sure. Um, so we have a couple of research studies um, that we've conducted um, with consumers about combination products and long-term care. Um, these results are from a consumer sentiment study we did back in, in 2021. Um, and we asked consumers a number of questions about their interest in combination products, about why they would want to buy it, and, and um, some interesting questions on, on how they like to receive care. Um, so you can see that these really move into a few buckets. First of all, there's that stress, that's their, that financial concern um, that Flory talked about, that they're concerned their long-term care cast might deplete their savings. Um, the, the consumers who've seen that with their parents and their grandparents um, are very aware um, and probably saw that happen with their parents. Um, and then we move into um, reasons that have to do with cost. Um, and and perhaps a little bit of money savings. So they see it's more economical. They like the idea of combining a life and a long-term care policy into one product and think that that might be a little better use, e more economical use of their funds. Um, they like the, um, I don't have to use it or lose it, right? So they'll get a benefit whether they need long-term care or not. They still have that life insurance benefit as well. Um, and then we see, again, references to cost. Um, any consumer survey we do where we're talking to consumers about life insurance um, or any other type of product, cost is always a concern. And we find that consumers really sometimes overestimate the cost of the product. Um, so with that, um, you know, that's, that's something that's pretty common as well. Um, so interestingly enough, when we talk to consumers about whether they'd be interested in a combination product, 
um, here we're looking at this by generation, the younger buyers um, that that Flory and her company and other companies have been moving towards have a higher level of interest, which I thought was really interesting. Um, now, just boomers may already have life insurance, right? They may already own a product at this point or, or have set this up um, for themselves. Um, but again, we've seen in our research that the millennials and the, the, the younger Gen Xers really do have a higher level of financial concern sometimes. So in that respect, that's really not that surprising to us. Um, so that's great news. Um, the other impact on interest to buy combination products is whether or not a consumer has been a caregiver or has been exposed to being a caregiver to somebody in their family. Um, so we saw in the pandemic that um, the pandemic increased interest in life insurance sales by a significant amount because people were faced with their own mortality. Similarly with long-term care, um, those who have provided care or been exposed to that with an older relative have a higher level of interest in these products as well. And um, so, so I think there's an opportunity there with those younger markets. Uh, Flory, was there anything in this survey that surprised you? Not really, um, right? The 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 um, the ones that stick out and what we hear from clients a lot, right? They like that. Oh, if I don't use it, it's not just money gone. And, and you have to, we have to remember when we talk about long term care. The average client, say they're in their mid fifties, maybe sixties, um, they're statistically not going to need this for twenty to thirty years, right? So if asking a client to pay into a policy where if they don't need it there's nothing back. That's a big thing. So that's where, you know, the, I like it because there's a value if I don't need long-term care. And even though we know statistically 70% chance of needing it, we are optimistic Americans. And we always think it's the person sitting next to me, not myself, that's going to need the care. Um, and then the other component of that, that um, stuck out is, right, when client, when people see and experience it, right? Long-term care is one of the more financially and emotionally involved events. And I think that becomes a trigger of, gosh, I may have assets, but do I really want to spend them on care? Are there, is there a better way, right? Can I use, you know, clients like that, they'll say, oh, I can use a dollar of mine for $3 of the insurance companies um, from, from that perspective. And so that that is of interest, um, even if they could afford to pay for care, they think they could, there's a better way to, to maximize their assets. So no big surprises there. Um, but absolutely, I think, um, you know, driver is there's value if they don't need care and we hope we don't. Um, and better to, to have some protection on their portfolio because we see, you know, we have a statistic that I think the average withdrawal rate on a portfolio doubles when somebody needs long-term care, especially if a husband and wife are involved, right? You have to, healthy spouse is still needing to live in the house and do their daily life. And all of a sudden you need to pay for somebody else's care. That could double, it's like supporting two households at once. Um, and so those, those clients who've experienced that either with a the parent, they understand all of a sudden that the withdrawal rate can erode the portfolio much faster than they had planned. Yeah, and I think the sandwich care generation, you know, where you've got people in the middle who are caring for their parents and to some extent their children. And I, when I look at this chart, this graphic, it makes me think that, you know, how can we really capture the amount of stress? It seems to be increasing, especially as people live longer and, you know, they have more complications. And I think on top of that, that excellent point that, you know, there aren't the pensions around anymore and people are relying, uh, you know, on their advisors really uh, to help them get through all this. Um, speaking of that, Flory, what channel and what setting is best suited for these products? Do you see Life LTC uh, suited best for overall financial planning or is it more of a regular life insurance sale through an agent? So we believe we should really meet the client where they want to be met, right? So if they're seeking their advice through a financial professional and more in the advisor space, then 
the, to have the, the ability to have solutions offered there, right? If they're going and seeking more and working with a, an insurance agent for their planning. Now, overall, all of it, whether it's an insurance agent or a financial advisor, it should be a, a part of an overall greater financial plan, right? You don't want decisions being made in a vacuum, especially on something you know, as significant as this. Um, but we do believe it's important that the solutions are available in both channels um, so that wherever the client is seeking their advice, um, that, that it, the solutions are available to be, to be offered to the clients in both of those spaces. Great. I think that's a good segue into our next poll question. So Ashley, would you uh, post that for us? Yeah, the next poll we have is what best describes your general client interests in a life LTC product? Is it very high, moderate, low interest, or you never hear about it? It seems like moderate interest, John. Okay, yeah, that's almost surprising to me. I expected it to be very high, but I guess moderate makes sense. All right, so now let's talk about the impacts on the LTC insurance market. Uh, LTC, uh, Karen, LTC and hybrid products exploded in 2021, as you mentioned, um, but that was due to motivation from one state in particular. Fill us in on what happened in Washington to boost sales. Right. Well, um, if there's one way to boost interest and awareness of a product, it's introducing a law that um, uh, tells consumers that you're going to tax their income if they don't own it. <laughs> All right. um, so in Washington state, um, the state government passed um, the Washington CARES Act back in 2019. Um, there was a deadline of November 2021. Um, for consumers to prove that they had long-term care coverage through private coverage. And if not, if they, if they didn't apply for and receive that exemption, then the payroll tax would go into place uh, where uh, the state would take money out um, through their employers and put it into a fund um, to fund their long-term care needs in the future. Um, and a very small amount. Um, the lifetime maximum, I think, was about thirty thousand dollars. So this was um, it was a start to coverage, but it certainly wasn't a substitute for private long-term care coverage in the state. Um, so you can see the impact of this on sales in the life market. You can see um, so life long-term care extension and acceleration riders, and then also standalone long-term care had some pretty significant growth in second quarter 2021, and then even more significant growth in terms of the combination products in third quarter as we were coming up to that deadline. Now that growth could possibly have been significantly higher. Um, there was so much application activity um, associated with this that carriers actually stopped accepting applications in the state of Washington for a period of time um, in order to, to manage that risk. Um, so after that, after the November deadline, that exemption was not available anymore, and it still isn't available today. Washington has um, tweaked their law, um, provided some additional exemptions in terms of people who, who work there but live out of state for veterans and, and so forth. Um, but right now, purchasing long-term care coverage in Washington will not um, get you that exemption. Um, so again, this is definitely something to watch because this is Washington state. This actually impacted national life insurance sales trends in the fourth quarter, the third and fourth quarter of 2021. And you can just imagine the volumes we might see if other states around the country do do this. And there are some other states um, that are looking into um, laws such as the Washington CARES Act in their states. So which of the other states now are looking into that, uh, Karen? Um, so there's, there's quite a few. Um, California, is looking into that. They have a task force um, in play where they are working together with, um, with consumer groups and, and industry members and, and other regulators um, and uh, Oliver Wyman to um, come up with some potential scenarios 
Um, so they're in the midst of that evaluation process. Um, New York is also looking into this, um, Minnesota and several other states. Not many are close to, actually, I would say none are actually close to actually implementing um, a law in the near future, but it's definitely something to watch. Yeah, and it's created a little bit of controversy as well. I know that I think in California, the insurance commissioner uh, warned advisors and agents recently to watch their marketing on this. So there's a lot of consternation and, and controversy as this happens at the same time. Um, Flory, I'm sure you're paying attention to public policy developments at Lincoln. Um, this all serves as Karen said, to build awareness of LTC coverage. How is that growing awareness and the baby boomer retirement demographic driving your market? Yeah, I, I think it's important just to kind of to address the kind of the rumors going around, right? In California, you had people advertising, right? You must put plan in place before 1-1-2024. And if not, that's the task force has until then to even come out with a plan. So how can you say you have to have an insurance by this date, right? And then it has to go through this legislator, right? So I think it's one, honesty is really important. That said, it's a great way to raise awareness because people who would be concerned about this, right? Clients who are working, right? In their working years, who are running up to retirement, this type of, of legislation could significantly impact them. Right. And if like we don't even know if there's going to be an exemption. Right. Because for the program to work, you need to have everybody paying into it. Right. Theoretically. And if if those high income earners who can afford LTC policies opt out of it, it's not going to work. That said, overall awareness around long term care is never a bad thing. So that's been our messaging to agents and advisors and us working with different state insurance commissions is that it's never a bad time. And if this helps spur the discussion, right, you can say, gosh, we don't know what's going to happen in California. But regardless of what California does, long term care is a significant issue that we should plan for. So it's actually helped advisors and agents have an excuse to bring up long term care, where before it was that sort of, especially in the financial advisor space, it was that, oh, by the way, we need to talk about long term care, or I, I like to think of myself as the money manager. And now how do I have this conversation? Um, so I think it's actually been a way to, to, to broach a, what could have been a sensitive subject in the past. And now that we know it could potentially affect our tax implications and wallet share and mind share, it's a, it's a good way to have and talk about long-term care. The boomer piece of it, right? That's just, they're starting to need care, right? Or you know, having just experienced pa parents. So it puts the issue front and center and it's not this um you know, kind of conceptual thing but it's something they've lived so as the boomers start to see this happen in their own lives whether it's to spouses or parents then it's just again it's that's more event driven right where like oh gosh i just saw what, how much money my mom spent on care or i was just the caregiver more importantly that then becomes the, I don't wanna do this to my kids or I don't have kids who's going to take care of me. So the, the different legislative issues going on, and we actually are going to be coming out and uh, with a piece around this, um, just all the different legislative things to be aware of, just to keep people in tune um, and have a lobbyist on staff actively working just to make sure we're informed. Um, so you know, we, more to come on that because we do want to make sure people are informed and they're not making decisions with false information. Okay, thanks. And that's really helpful. And we'll be following that information <laughs> as you <laughs> put it out too. Uh, is Lincoln planning any further product offerings or enhancements in this life LTC space? We are always, right, for 35 years, we've led innovation. So we're always looking to how can we reach more clients, right? How can we better serve the advisors and agents and their clients? Um, so from that perspective, right, it was, you know, simplified underwriting, which made it less, less scary on the extension side. When I say scary, let's, you know, like, you know, some people say, oh, I don't want to go through that whole process now. It's, you know, 
We have e-interview, right? Clients now can do the health component just online, which is which is nice. Um, flex pay, right? We can now extend premiums out. Money Guard Market Advantage, which is our variable solution, that now makes up almost half our business, right? Wow. So, and that's a solution that's been around for less than three years. To all of the sudden, I think on its own could be a top, you know, in the top you know, five of the the um, hot, like LTC extension solutions. So we're letting that innovation kind of ride, see what else what else we could do with that. Um, but we are always looking at and and always welcome to hear what people would like to see, right? Um, we 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 do have some advisory councils with agencies we work with and and broker dealers to see you know what are clients asking for, what are they looking for? Do we, we have a uh, first a round of research coming out in the next few months as well of like what are clients wanting? So we've never stopped innovating. We plan to continue to innovate um, in in terms of what the, what's next. You'll just have to see. <laughs> All right, we'll keep our eyes on that. Thanks very much for it. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to pivot here to briefly address how Gen Z and the millennial markets are looking at life insurance. These are the youth demographics insurers have long attempted to make inroads with. Uh, what is Limer discovering among these age groups, Karen? Um, well, first of all, that financial stress that we mentioned earlier is definitely an issue uh, with our younger age groups. So we um, we asked our consumers in our consumer sentiment survey if they were what level of stress they were under, um, and you can and what types of stress they're under, and you can see um, there's a multitude of of factors here addressing the younger generations, um, especially you know, those household finances, um, um, work issues, um, they're concerned about their own personal well-being, they're worried about caregiving, they're worried about many, many, many other factors. So there's a lot on their minds and there's a lot um, that they're thinking about when we approach them to buy our products. Um, interestingly, we did a, a live consumer focus group um, with uh, millennials on long-term care coverage at our recent supplemental health conference ba back in August. And this came up a lot um, because when we talked to them about long-term care, they said, yeah, I probably need it, but I need to pay my bills. I need to, to pay my mortgage. I need to save for college. Um, and we it, it they're definitely interested. Um, we had some planners in the group who'd actually started, you know, looking into the products um, and others that said, yeah, I do need to look into it, but I, that'll be farther down the road. Um, when you point out that their costs are going to be much higher if they wait 10 or 20 years, then the planners in the group start getting really interested in, again, that cost savings they might have. It, it tended to move it up on their priority list a little bit. Um, so there is some movement there with, with some of those stressors. Um, there is a way um, for advisors to reach out and talk to consumers um, and, and talk to those younger groups about interest in long-term care and, and lifelong term care products. Um, but again, they're dealing with a lot. You know, we, we hear about student loan debt and, and, and all the other factors going on. Um, in terms of their financial priorities and concerns, um, not surprisingly, um, they're interested in having enough money for retirement. Flory mentioned that we don't have pensions for a lot of, of people so far, so that's that's top of mind. Um, and then significant interest in just being able to, to pay the bills, um, disability insurance, and so forth. Um, so again, a, a wide range of concerns among consumers for all generations. Um, but definitely among the younger generations as well. Um, the good news is that um, that there is a um, an opportunity here in terms of um, of selling. So Gen Z and Millennials are less likely to own life insurance. Um, they're interested in buying life insurance. Um, more so than the general population. Um, so they are open to the concept of insurance products. Um, and again, when we go 
and ask consumers why they don't buy insurance, um, even though there's interest in it. Again, we see that expense concern, um, that perhaps the a little bit of an overestimation in terms of what it might cost them, um, especially when they're younger on an annual basis. So that's uh, that's a factor. And then again, just that share of wallet um, and procrastination, right? So they've got a lot going on and they, they just haven't gotten to it. So these aren't new, you know, we, we've been surveying consumers on life insurance interest and reasons for buying and not buying for, for many, many years. And these are always some of the, the top reasons that we see among consumers. Um, if you do want to reach these younger generations, though, social media is the place to be right now, um, especially among the Gen Z that are coming into the market. Um, so, you know, that's that's important to get your presence out there, um, whether it be on you know Facebook or TikTok. Um, we do see can some younger consumers actually getting their financial information from TikTok. So um that's uh, not necessarily a place that a lot of advisors are right now, I don't think. Um, so something to keep in mind. Now that said, this past year in our insurance barometer study, for the first time, younger adults said that if you, they were given their preference, they'd prefer to purchase life insurance online as opposed to face-to-face. But that comes with a caveat because they do realize that that's not necessarily potentially an option. And there's also, I think, still a level of discomfort there. So insurance is complicated, um, especially when you start looking at these life long-term care combination products. And it's not like buying a car online or a phone online, right? You're, if you're buying something like that, you kind of know, you know what features you want in the phone. Consumers are less confident in their understanding of life insurance. So what that really translates to, I think, in our research is they're interested in getting the information online. They want to do their homework. They want to go and and make sure that they have um, impartial sources before they talk to a person. But at the end of the day, they do still want help um, when it comes to purchasing insurance. I find it interesting that uh, the millennials and the Gen Z are the most stressed, going back to your earlier slide, generation. So I would think their appetite for addressing some of this, you know, would seem to be pretty high. What lessons can we take from these barometer findings about how agents and advisors need to adapt to younger customers uh, with technology, for example? Well, I think to Flory's point about meeting customers where they are, these younger generations are are online and they're on social media. You know, so we still need the traditional channels and avenues and face-to-face meetings and and that we've always had, but we also need to expand to get them the information where they're looking when they're interested, um, because they have all of these stresses and one of those is time, right? So if they're on social media. And that's where they're looking for information. You know, if if the information isn't there, they're not going to find it. Um, so I think that I think I think just in a general awareness of all the stressors and all the different things they have going on in their lives right now. Um, again, we mentioned student loan debt and um, the difficulty with rising interest rates on being able to purchase a house, right? All these financial pressures and being able to kind of position. The insurance is something that's going to protect their ability to do this going forward. If you have life insurance and you die, if you do get to buy a house, you want to be able to keep that house, right, for your family. Yeah. Lori, uh, Flory, how is Lincoln, this is, you know, just how, how does Lincoln think about this in terms of social media and reaching out through technology? Is that a priority for Lincoln? Absolutely, and we'll be rolling out a, a new, just overall Lincoln campaign over the next few months, where we're really trying to feel more relevant. More, you'll see more aspects of social, right? Whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I actually keep Karen. My husband makes fun of me because he's like, "What new health kick? And where did you find it?" I'm like, "Oh, Instagram." And he's like, "Oh, we're in so much trouble, right? <laughs> and that's our new news source." So. But it's funny because I've been getting marketed to by Lincoln 
for some of our, in, our, our annuity solutions. And I was, I said to our, our, our head of, of brand and marketing, I was like, why am I not getting money guard and like marketed? I want to get marketed that way because really, truly like that stuff as we're scrolling in our phones that it's right there. Right. Um, so we are trying to look at social. I did an interview of a candidate the other day because uh, we've hired uh, a, a, so like a, one of our concierge care claims representatives that I said, Eddie, how did you find out about us? He goes, well, this, that, and he goes, and then I watched a TikTok <laughs> on how MoneyGuard works. <laughs> and it was actually Rob Johnson, who's one of our wholesalers who supports the, the brokerage um, and, and, and the agency side. But like it, that was a light bulb went off. He was like, okay, here's somebody in his early 30s who's been in the industry, but to learn about MoneyGuard, he went to TikTok. Right, so we do have to have a presence on LinkedIn. We need to have a website, right, where if somebody's trying to do research on 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 your on your team, on yourself, on your company, that they can find it. Because if it doesn't exist on the internet, it's not real. Now we're used to saying just because it exists on the internet, it's it doesn't mean it's real. But I would say, like for that younger consumer, if they can't find it on social, it's not. It doesn't exist. So we are trying to show up LinkedIn, big presence. Um, again, Facebook, Instagram, trying to figure out. And then the next wave, like TikTok was faster. That, that took on really fast. Um, yeah. So yeah, absolutely, it's important. Um, and it's important to have advisors and even like seminar wise, right? Podcasts are so easy, right? So like have a podcast. Um, there's lots of different ways to reach your clients. Um, and, and I think it's important that you show up in most of those places, depending on who's looking for you. Aaron, did your research uh, point out any favorite places or methods? Because uh, I'm hearing so much about TikTok recently as a major place and Facebook seems to have aged out, you know, and that sort of thing. Did you have any data on the specifics? Um, we do. I don't think TikTok was really one of the major <laughs> locations quite but it's yet. The new, it's the new one, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. And there is a range. I mean, Facebook is definitely on the decline. Um, there's there's definitely interest in, in YouTube and Instagram um, and some of those locations. It, John and Karen, it's interesting, like YouTube, right? If you need to fix your sink now, right? Or fix a toilet. That's, right? all, that's what I, I do. I, right? YouTube is like the DIY. Um, yeah. I don't play around on YouTube enough, but I, who knows? There could be a DIY financial video out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, th th those are things to be considering. You know, that's a really good point, though. I know when I have a question, I'll go to YouTube and I'll just, you know, type in what I'm looking for and there'll be an explainer or 10 or, or 100 explainer videos. I think that's good advice for advisors, you know, who can uh, educate uh, young people on some of these attributes and needs. That's a great place to put your content because it will be found. All someone needs to do is ask the right question and you'll come up. So I think uh, agents and advisors have a different way to think about this than they have in the past to get out there. Uh, but yeah, I, I love YouTube for that. <laughs> Um, all right, so Ashley, do we have uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah, that was a lot of great information. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, what is the statistical average age of needing LTC? I, I can answer that one. Um, so the average age for a long time has been quoted as age 80. Uh, it, it's really 78 for men and about 83 for women. Um, for us, our average claimant at Lincoln today is 83, right? It's a little bit right? <laughs> a healthier person who could qualify for LTC. They'll probably go older than the average. Um, but we do expect that with health developments to continue to go up, pushing up into the mid to late 80s. Wow, so, good to know. Yeah, it's like today's average, right? People who are in their 80s today had people in their 50s today buying long-term care. Very, there, a lot could change in that next 30 years. So, um, that, but that, yeah, those are the averages there. Great, thank you. Um, do you guys have any marketing material available that is directed toward the younger generation? 
We are working on that. Um, I know that like we, speaking of being available online, we have a, a website called the Conversation Catalyst <clears throat> that where clients can go out and actually see what the cost of care is, put in zip codes, and then they can actually construct on how they would want to fund um, a policy. And depending if they're investment minded or more conservative, it would take them to the, the fixed or the variable product. So we are trying to talk about showing up where clients are looking. We are trying to have a more of an online interactive presence. Um, and, and we do have some of our, our, our marketing directed towards younger clients thinking about in their, you know, again, and if we get clients in their thirties allocating income, this is an easier discussion um, than it is a 65 year old who's had health issues. Lori, can you um just what is your website? I, I should know this by heart. I believe I'm gonna look it up really fast. <laughs> okay, no worries. I, I know I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> catalyst. I will. I'll put it in the chat. Great. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> um. So the last question we have here is. <clears throat> I have worked many years as a special education teacher. I am concerned that children that are handicapped will need LTC very early. Uh, what can I offer to school systems and parents to bring up that conversation? So, Flory, I could be wrong, but that might be pretty difficult to underwrite in terms of a, a special needs child. I think I think there's probably other solutions besides long-term care insurance that might be a better a better solution for that. Yeah, Karen, in those situations, that's a tough one, right? Just be, and I have I have a um, special needs cousin who he will be, you know, for you know, he will outlive, but we need to be my my aunt, but will need care for the remainder of his life. And how do you plan for that? I think that's where making sure you work with a really good um, a state, you know, a state and trust planning attorney working very closely with um, the, just their financial advisor and, and, and where can insurance, where, 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 where does an insurance play, right? I think maybe it makes it that much more compelling for the parents if they can afford it to buy life insurance to make sure that they're leaving a legacy to help care for that special needs child, right? So I think you, when we think about special needs, we really need to think about, okay, we're making sure the trust work is in place so that that child, as they become a, a, an adult, has the capacity, the care that they need and the structure there. And can life insurance help fund that um, after the parents are maybe no longer here? So it, it can be a tricky one for sure. Great, thank you. All right, John, that was all we had for today. All right. Well, those were great questions. The discussion was great. Thank you both Flory and Karen for an excellent uh, session. And as always, Ashley, thanks for guiding us through it. <laughs> of course. All right. Thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, you will be receiving an email with a recording of today's webinar and it will also be available on our website. Uh, have a great day. Thanks everybody.